Her name is Meezy. Go save the bacon, mommy. Hello, welcome back to the Red Pill Buddhas podcast. And today I've got a great episode with my friend Neethi Bali. Now, Neethi is a proper warrior. She's the founder and CEO of Farm to Fork Meat Riot, a 501c3 nonprofit organization serving as a catalyst for re-establishing the regenerative and small family farm food system. I had to read that one out, but we'll get that into get into that a bit later and, and, and find out what she's doing with that. But I'd just like to say that Neethi's story is amazing. It's really inspiring. I mean, so many of us came to do what we do because of um, some illness, usually something that went wrong with us. But Neethi's story of, uh, of, of, of tragedy turned into amazing positivity and creativity is I find really, really inspiring. And if she wants to, we can touch a little on that later on, but it's, it's amazing what Neethi's done um, with, with what she, she's experienced in the past. Beautiful, beautiful turnaround. And uh, welcome, Neethi. Thank you for having me, Phil. I appreciate, you know, I, I just, I'm a, I'm a fan of your work. So thank you. Oh, I'm very honored. Thank <laughs> you so much. Um, you know, I wanted to start off just finding out where you grew up, how you grew up, what, what formed the, uh, the young Neethi. And uh, yeah, tell us a bit about your past. Well, let's see. I, um, our parents are um, first generation. Well, they migrated here from India, our parents. So our parents were born slaves of the British India Company, which, you know, was wonderful. <laughs> um, I was born here in Niagara Falls, New York, and I actually grew up in Charlotte, North Carolina. So I'm more of a Carolina girl, hence my lack of Indian accent over here. <laughs> um, I grew up um, at a great time. I thought it was fun. I mean, we were always outside running around. Um, I think that our parents did a really good job, uh, like free ranging us. <laughs> there was no oversight. We just, we were always told to go outside, you know, as long as the sun was shining. And even if it was raining, <laughs> if it was daytime, you should go outside. And so um, I spent I spent my time outside a lot, and even even um, at uh, you know I was in a regular school, you know like the regular public school or whatever when I was growing up. But at that time, you know, at least here in the states, we had you know like a well-rounded curriculum where there was art and music and theater, and you know. Um, it wasn't as if you just went to school. There was reading, writing, arithmetic, you know, uh, science, history, but mostly there was, there was also a lot of time. Like we used to have like long lunch hour. We had a full uh, hour outside of recess every day or gym or something. Like when we got older and kids don't want to go outside because, you know, you're too cool for school, then you had PE so that you had to move and, you know, do things. Um, so, and I'll also, the other thing that we had was home economics, you know, and industrial arts. So you had industrial arts included carpentry, um, you know, mechanics. So you worked with engines and things like that. Um, and home ec included all the economics that you need to know for running a household, you know, like managing a checkbook or whatever, banking, cooking, baking, cleaning, like you know, I think it's fascinating. No one teaches their kids or kids today have no training on how to just like make, make breakfast, you know, how to wash dishes or, you know, why you should clean. <laughs> like we have hot water now. Like there was a time when there was no hot water. And, you know, so because there was no clean hot water, there were, you know, diseases being created <laughs> and imbalances and now that's being created for absolutely no reason <laughs> because we we have everything that we need to be able to um manage uh properly and people just just you know they they made first they took the man out of the home right 
and then they attacked the family and then they realized the mama was in the way. And so they took the mother out of the home and, you know, they made women believe that they were not worthy um, if they stayed home, if they were just staying at home, because, you know, you're just a homemaker, like just a homemaker, you know, <laughs> and, 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 and tricked women into believing that they needed to go work for someone outside of, outside of their family, not work for their family, um, not serving but, their family. But I mean, you know, it, that's kind of valid, isn't it? Because as, as everyone knows, men can stay at home these days and chest feed. I know. Isn't it fascinating that you have a lot of the broken marriages that I see um, Phil, are because these men have become man childs or man children or something. And they, I mean, there is an attack on men, you know, for sure. I don't know what's going on with my camera here. Sorry. <laughs> uh, you have to, have to go back. It focuses in the middle, I think. Oh, I'm sorry. I don't know why that <laughs> happened. But anyway, yeah, I don't, I don't know what's going on with, um, with men, uh, I mean, well, we know that there was an attack on, on men, right? There was an attack on men, you know, um, where, you know, I mean, it, no one, okay, so Mr. Global or the people in charge, the few, you know, there's few people in charge and more of us, right? So the few people who are in charge, they wanted to diminish men to the degree that they no longer um, I mean, basically women hated them, right? Now they have like feminism today is women hating men. I think that's amazing. And that was after they made the world believe that women were anything less than queens, which is ridiculous because women were always queens, you know? Um, and, and the other part of it is, you know, they, they talk about this uh, pay uh, variance between men and women. Well, you know, I think that a lot of these young people don't remember, they don't know, it, they don't know on purpose because history is being rewritten. But um, it used to be that the only way a man could get a position um, that was like in a managerial or a higher up, you know, position um, was if he was married and if he had a family. And if he wasn't married or didn't have a family, then he could not um, you know, even earn that position because everyone felt like, well, if he can't even keep a wife, then he can't, you know, run this business. And so um, when they would interview, they would also interview the wife. That is the reason for the dinner parties. Like if you were trying to get a promotion, then it was, you know, required for the person who was interviewing for the position to host the, you know, potential new boss in their home so that the boss could see that, you know, how well put together the, the, the wife was and that she's capable of managing the household and taking care of the husband because his salary was 50% her salary. They were paying her to make sure that he was able to perform to, you know, like they were being hired together as a couple so that she would make sure that he was able to do his job. And she was then also able to, you know, influence her community uh, because whatever philanthropic work that corporation would do in the community would be based on her input. So if the schools needed new library books or I don't know, whatever they needed to fund in the community, those women were able to go to the corporation and say, hey, we need, you know, we're raising money for this or that or whatever. And so they would have the bake sale or, or whatever you want to call it. But it was being funded by, you know, the cor the corporation would say, oh, for the bake sale, we'll give this much money, but everybody else in the community would also contribute, you know, something. So um, women were queens and that uh, pay pay difference that people are talking about you know that changed like I guess in the 90s maybe it changed in the 90s where all of a sudden there were men in managerial positions 
because I think that's about when I don't know if it was the 80s or the 90s I can't remember right now like when was it when women left the home actually and started you know I think that song by Ajoli you know I can bring home the bacon and fry it up in a pan song the commercial I think that was in the 80s so it must have been in the 80s when they were trying to get women to you know create these corporate positions or, or go for corporate positions and that was also when they had a lot of divorces you know because there was they they pitted men and women against each other and that was the beginning of the destruction of the home it's amazing it's been split up on so so many levels hasn't it it, it is now it's um but but it's the splitting up of all of our, our 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 lifestyle on so many levels and i mean the work that you do is um is incredible because it's bringing us back to that sort of ancestral heritage and and this is what we need to come back to on all sides and there's nothing sexist about saying men are men and women are women <laughs> i mean i mean ricky I'm, Jeff, a bigot and I'm a sexist and a bigot and a racist and all these things because i remind people of the truth well you know one of the things that happened to us when mina you know like with everything that we went through one of the main things that i was was taught or reminded was that you know i need i when you go through a crisis like we went through a crisis then you're trying to find your footing okay and, and the only way to really find your footing or gr ground yourself again in in my view um, is to find, you know, where is that solid ground? Where is it? Well, for me, you know, it was very simple. It was the law of nature. All the laws of the universe are solid, right? Like the law of gravity. You know, I, I just lean on that. I say this a lot. Um, you know, it's the only way for me to know what is real and what is not. And the only the only, you know, I always come right back to, to that moment where, okay, you know, I'm constantly doing some litmus tests for myself. Like, what, what are they saying? Oh, this doesn't pass the test of, you know, of natural or universal law. And so, um, you know, a lot of folks are always saying to me, Phil, they're like, well, what is your religion? You know, I'm like, <laughs> It's the law of the universe, you know. Um, I think that people have forgotten basic, the basic tenets of, you know, just what it means to be a human. <laughs> I want to definitely come back to that with you later. That was something that I planned on having a chat about. But, it, you know, you did touch on it there. And perhaps some people watching on my channel might not know that story of yours. So what was that powerful awakening for you? Yeah. Um, so... In 2007, our two-year-old daughter, Minakshi, was diagnosed with esthesia neuroblastoma, and we ended up at Duke Children's Hospital. And, you know, when we got there, then, you know, my husband and I were in complete shock. What we found out was that my daughter's head was basically full of a solid mass tumor. So for those of you who don't know, the reason that children's heads are so heavy is they have this thing, it's called a rock bone. It's the sphenoid bone. It sets in the center of the head and it opens up eventually into the sinus cavity. And it, generally, um, you know, your sinus cavity doesn't start developing until later on. And so, you know, children have this rock bone that's just kind of opening and opening inside of their head until they're, I don't know, 14, I think it might be like, I'm not a doctor. Okay. So I don't know, whatever, between 13 and 15 sometimes. And so until then they're very clumsy. You know, you might notice that kids are, their head is just a little too heavy. So they're, they're pretty clumsy. And in her case, um, we were so shocked that her head was, was infiltrated in this way because she was brilliant. She was articulate. She was developing beautifully otherwise right so it was very hard to understand how did this happen um and the sphenoid bone sits underneath the um this you know the brain has a frontal lobe right here and then um the sphenoid bone sits right about here so the frontal lobe just kind of sets on top of it so it's not a brain tumor it was outside of the brain it was under the brain 
And it was where all the other vital structures are. So it was, you know, threatening the thyroid and it was wrapped around her uh, carotid artery and it was, you know, threatening her optical nerves and everything. And it was just, the cancers were just eating up everything. It ate her entire sphenoid bone. So upon presentation, she was already palliative at best, meaning she was not going to survive because she, her structure was gone. Like, let's just say you kill all the cancer and everything, then now what? There's no structure there at all, right? So what this experience taught me, taught me many, many things, but one, one is she was palliative at best. So any treatment was doing harm. I want everybody out there to listen to me very carefully. Any treatment a physician would have wanted to do at this point would be doing harm. Let's just think about that. So what is the Hippocratic Oath? First, do no harm. So why were they treating my daughter? Their response to us should have been, oh no, look at what's happened. I'm so sorry. Let us support you, you know, with, I don't know, pain management or whatever you need so that you can enjoy your child because she's not going to survive this. And we already know that. But they didn't do that. Instead, what they said was, oh, um, we can try chemo. Oh, we can try whatever, whatever it was. And, um, you know, they try to do radiation, chemo, and they said they couldn't do surgery because it was too much. It was too big. I mean, thank God they said that because we would have just said, okay, let's operate. And they would have just killed her in surgery. Right. But, but it was just amazing. Um, you know, that they didn't think about, they didn't think about her. They didn't think about us. They didn't think about the clock. They were all like, emergency, emergency, you need to drop your whole life and come here immediately and then give us all your money. That's really what it was. And so um, the long and the short of that experience was that we lived there for six months where we accomplished nothing except, I call it human torture therapy in my book. Um, I, I've written in detail in my book what happened while we were there. So if you're interested in knowing that, just, just read the book um, because you'll get it in context and that matters. I think it matters for you to read it in context. But I think that, um, I'm sorry, Phil, I don't know what's going on with the camera and I don't know how to make it stop. Oh, you just have to have to sit near the middle so that it focuses on you. It focuses on the wall sometimes. That's what happens. Oh, am I moving? There we go. Sorry. Now, Rithi, I mean, I've just got to sort of jump in at that point and say you just just I'm so sorry and I mean god what a powerful story I mean I've only seen this kind of second hand in a way but my son had an aneurysmal bone cyst in his neck when he was about 11 and he had to have a whole vertebra removed not just a, a, a disc but a whole vertebra and um, we went in for two horrible operations where he had they had to take most of it out from the back and then go through the front in between the, the sort of trachea and the and the arteries and scrape this um, uh, sort of squashy um, um, vertebra as it had become off the spinal cord and then replace it with uh, sort of titanium scaffolding. He's, he's like 32 now and he still has that in his neck. You know, his x-ray looks like proper scaffolding. And mm -hmm. It was uh, it was incredibly traumatic, although if he didn't die in surgery, he wasn't going to die from it. But I did spend a good sort of two or three weeks in hospital with with mums, with kids with with sort of spinal cancer and things like that. And and it's it was tragic enough at the time, you know, feeling that hopelessness and that vibe and that last bit of love they were giving their kids. But since then, it's now I understand what they're actually doing to them in there. Yeah. It's been really tragic to me to see one of the most tragic things that in the world, which is when the kids get killed, you know, by the process 
And then afterwards they say how wonderful the docs were. And then they start up some kind of fundraiser for cancer research and things like that. Nothing you can say, nothing you can I say. I did, I said a lot. Well, I'm sure you can, because it's happened to you, right? And so you have that, you have that thing you know, that, that authority to say that. I, I, I can't say that. If I see anything like that, I just steer well, well clear. But it, it really gets my heart. Anyway, I just wanted to say that, that just, you know, I, I, I know exactly how spot on you are with this story. Carry on. Anyway. Yeah. No, I mean, uh, you're talking about these fundraisers they do. Oh my gosh. I mean, you know, what I want to say to everyone out there is please do not fund any cancer research. Like, do not, do not do it. And especially don't do it in the name of my child. Oh my God. You know, that makes me sick. It makes me ill. You know, people say, oh, we did this for Mina. No, you did not. You did this because you're, you don't know what's going on. And it's, it's, it's awful. You're funding the murderers. I mean, you know, I, I say that she was medically murdered because the MMR vaccination is what caused her cancer markers to turn on. I figured out later, you know, cause I could go back and think about like her medical and I talk about it in the book. Okay. So I explain, you know, how did I come to this conclusion? It was not lightly. And I feel um, like I'm some kind of hematology oncologist from my experience because, you know, I'm sorry, but like, there's, n I don't think that, I don't think anybody research researches as powerfully as a mother trying to save their child like or a parent I should just say maybe not a mother but like any parent like I'm sure whatever you were dealing with or you've ever had to go through you've you know it inside and out because even the physicians don't have time to research each diagnosis in the way that we were researching you know whatever was going on with our kids and and what I what I've learned is that they know nothing. They know nothing. And, and they're not supposed to know anything because if they could help you, then, you know, they wouldn't be able to make any money. And this has been the largest snake oil scam in history. In history, because it was, all, you know, the standard of care that was established with, in 1910 with the Flexner report is what this came from. It stems all the way back to in 1910 when Rockefeller and Carnegie became the primary investors in uh, pharmaceuticals and they were already the largest investors in petrochemicals. Um, they had this man Flexner write a report telling Congress that they should no longer fund anyone who's practicing medicine um, who views the body as having energy. I don't know if anybody understands like what a, a, a powerful and crazy statement that is. And um, and they sold it to Congress under the guise of, you know, Americans are so amazing and so special and should get, you know, the best treatment. So we have to establish a standard of care. And so this standard of care is the best standard in the world, you know, which they went on to impose this standard of care all over the world. And um, any physician, who wants to operate outside of allopathy, meaning like your only solution can be some prescription drug. And if they don't have a drug, by the way, there is no test for whatever is ailing you. Um, if you understand what I just said, like you really just marinate on that one thing, you would never go see a doctor again. Like, I don't think there's very much else to say in this conversation <laughs> after that. But like, not, a, not on that subject. No, you've nailed it completely. I mean, they're great for broken bones. They're great for, for sort of, you know, scans and things if you need them to find out what's going on. But <clears throat> their solutions are very, very seldom anything that you shouldn't just run away from. No. But, but um, they're, so they're creating. They're creating. So, you know, they are creating this disease because not only did they 
centralized medical, the medical system at that point, but they also, with the Flexner report, centralized the food, centralized schools, centralized the government, they centralized everything at that time, financial, you know, like the, the banking system, everything um, was centralized with the Flexner report. Isn't that convenient? Yeah, yeah. It was just the beginning of the end, wasn't it? And all the true healers were forced out and disgraced and fled to other countries and uh, got bumped off and all kinds of things. Hideous time. But what was it that then turned you around? And, and how did this sort of positivity come out of that to this amazing work that you're doing these days? Wow. Well, it wasn't it wasn't so beautiful and amazing at the beginning. <laughs> I, I, I had to get mad first. <laughs> so sure. Sure. I would say that um, immediately I was, I was just, you know, it was an assault. So we were assaulted and I had to recognize the assault and I had to reconcile the assault. And, um, you know, my husband and I both did that in different ways and different timing for sure. Um, but I think for myself, you know, it was just so obvious that they were not helping, but they were hurting. And one of the things, you know, one of the things I didn't say is that we were in the hospital and my husband and I had made a decision to get out of the hospital and take Mina out of the hospital. Um, and that time when we chose to leave which you really need to read in the book all of the things that went into how we came to this conclusion but when we decided that we were going to leave I was very pregnant with my third child and I was a high-risk pregnancy because of this crisis that we're going through you know and um I was standing outside with Mina and my son Kavi and Rohit was bringing the car around so that we could loaded up at the hospital with the rest of Mina's stuff. And um, a physician, I mean, like an attending was standing outside and he says to me, he says, well, good luck. He said, you know, your um, daughter's never going to see her brother or sister or never meet them. Meaning Minakshi was never going to meet the baby. Right. And I was like, who says that? Even if it's true, why would you say that to a pregnant mom? And that was the day that I was like, oh my God, the air, the nerve of this man, you know, and he, the, like the nerve of this whole institution and what have they done? And this is before we leave before we put her on real food and do my protocols and we, you know, cure her cancer, by the way, we cured her cancer. I don't even know how fast it was because we only tested, like we left the hospital in February, Phil. So it's February, March, April, May, four months later, we did an MRI and we went in for them to give us the results. And they told us that her um, solid mass tumor had now, it was necrotic and it had actually converted into a cyst. What? It was only growing when they had charge of her. You know what? It is, it, in these cases, sometimes these tumors can reverse very quickly. If There's a, a video on YouTube of my mom's breast cancer reversing, you know, when we did this carnivore diet and some iodine <clears throat> and it, re it reversed so quickly it was amazing when it did it went really fast when you go over that sort of hump there seems to be a way that the body can can get rid of it very quickly amazing stories of Anita Morjani um, who wrote a book called Dying to Be Me mm. and she sort of she was right at the end of life tumors everywhere all the relatives gathered and she could see what was going on you know although she was in a coma as so many people have said and then she had this real awakening and decided she was going to come back in the body. And sort of two weeks later, she had no tumors. So it, it, it's an amazing story if anybody hasn't seen Anita Morjani's story. But 
when these things do reverse, they can often do very quickly. Anyway, sorry, just that little point. No, I think that, you know, in my experience, um, regenerative meat heals so fast. And at that time, I didn't even know about carnivore. Like, I didn't know all the things that I know at this point. We were healing her just because we left the grocery store and we were getting meat from a farmer who was local. And we were getting vegetables from farmers that were local. And we, I mean, basically what I had done was I decided that if I don't know who raised it or who grew it or whatever, we weren't going to eat it. And so we weren't even eating GMO free. We were even still eating local wheat that we got from someone I was baking, you know, like, so basically I was just cooking from scratch at home. I was cooking from scratch at home even before that, but I was doing it with components from the grocery store. And so now the difference was that I was doing it from with using components that were local to our circadian rhythm, basically, you know, and what was amazing was even though those animals were eating like a GMO feed, because we didn't even know what GMOs were, okay, in 2007. I mean, Jeffrey Smith's book about genetic roulette, that was only published in 2009. So, you know, most of the publications and most of the information about GMOs only came out after 2009. And I mean, I was reading it as it was coming out, but it didn't come out until later. So um, it was really, really amazing that in four months, we put her on that food and we had such a huge turnaround. And who knows if we would have tested it sooner, because like I work with people and I can, you know, people who have cysts, they have ovarian bleeding, like crazy things happening. I can make it stop. I can make seizures stop in 24 hours, you know, like, so, I mean, I'm making a lot of bold statements here, but it's true, you know, and we can just do it dietarily. Um, but so, so I don't know, like in her case, it could have been within a week, who knows, but like four months we tested and she was fine. We extended her life for two years. So not only did she survive and meet her sister, she was, you know, she got to hang out and play with her, you know, for 18 months. And I am sure that the five rounds of chemo that she had were what, you know, turned around and, you know, she ended up having these massive tumors and things that came around all of a sudden after, you know, two years. And, um, and then she, she was gone like so fast, like all of a sudden it was very fast within three weeks, she was gone. And, you know, could we have stopped things or whatever? Like, you know, what I know for sure is that even if we could have, she was structurally not sound. So she wasn't going to make it no matter what. And the scariest thing to me was when her tumor became a cyst and it was now just this sack of fluid, you know, like I was terrified that it was just going to implode and she was just going to like die some horrible death, you know, like I didn't know what it was going to look like, or it was kind of frightening, but I used to try to not think about it, but you know, we literally were living with a gun to our head the whole time. And so when we lost Mina in 2009, I remember being in the hospital and the way that everything went down. And when I left, I was like, I bet I will never come back to the hospital again. Like, I don't care what's happening. It was, it was nuts. And I went back there and I don't, I don't know if you guys know this, but like I sat in the hospital for six months. There's 40 rooms on that, on that ward. And every single one of those kids was dead. Every family that I know that was there, their kid is dead. And then they try to say that there's like, I'm sorry, but like they, the last thing I'm gonna say about that is like some of those kids would go home in remission and come back and die within days, you know? And when they came back, there were a second case. So they counted the first one as a win, a cure. And the second, so if you are currently 
in a children's hospital and they're giving you statistics about how chemo works, it's based on bullshit. Because those kids go home in remission and they come in and they are dead within days. This is what we see so much in so many people when they've when they've done some kind of it, even even with the so Gerson therapy and stuff like that, if they get initial results, yeah. then very often it comes back later, plus all the plant toxin build up and all that sort of thing. Every and so, single time. Yeah. So the remissions they're claiming in, in both of these things that uh, it's it's just tragic. But, you know, let let's let, let me know how this how this took you and eventually you know, this, this, this lovely work that you're doing and, and, and how that inspired you once you got through that, um, that, that terrible phase after of having to come to terms with what they did. Yeah. So I, I write about this part in, in my book as well. I mean, I'll talk about it all, but like there's me while Mina was alive, then we were having insecurities with our farms meaning like we, they were saying, we don't know how much longer we'll be farming. You know, nobody really cares about farm fresh food. You guys are like, we can't just grow food for your family. Nisi. <laughs> that was kind of what the message was. And I thought, what do we have to do for you to keep farming? Because we need food and we're not going to buy it at the store ever again. And so um, I started, you know, trying to figure out how I was like, oh, maybe they just need marketing, you know? Uh, I didn't know, you know, that was, that was the time when I received a rapid education about how nobody cooks, nobody knows how to cook, you know, and all of these other things that I thought were crazy because I had no idea. I was like, how do people, how are you, you know, it's amazing to me. Like I will meet mothers who have teenage children and they've never fried an egg. They've never patted a burger. They don't know that you can take ground meat, minced meat, any of it, chicken, you know, beef, pork, whatever, and shape it into any shape that you want and just cook it, you know? And so, but they don't know that. And I'm like, you know, I was just really shocked. I thought, oh, they don't need just marketing. They need eaters to be educated about how to use food or how to buy raw components and make them into cooked meals. And I, I did not know that even the people within our friend group, most of them don't cook, but I had no idea. Like we would get together for, you know, you get together for a barbecue or something and somebody brings their dish that they make or whatever. And you always expect them to bring that dish, whatever it is. Well, come to find out that's the only dish they probably know how to make. And they don't actually know how to make anything else. Well, and so why would I know that? Like, why would I know that they day to day are otherwise just eating out or out of a box or whatever all the time? Because we're not, like I never, I, I would never just go to a drive through or something like that. And like, I also could never imagine leaving my house in the morning without feeding my children. Like it wasn't a thing that I would ever, ever do. So you know, you just don't know until you know, like, you know, so when I started looking for people who would want to support farms, like I was looking at our friends and I'm like, Hey guys, look at what I found out, you know, all this food in the store is poison. Do you guys want to, you know, support this farm with us? Like we found this out. We shouldn't be buying meat in a store. You know, you're just like, Hey, I just figured this out. You should just know too. Right. Um, so I'm just sharing it with friends and they're all looking at us. And I mean, that was when some people like, were like, stop Neethi we don't cook and I was like what <laughs> yeah I didn't because I didn't know and they were just like stop talking to us about this we don't actually cook and I thought I mean it was a, it was like um I was shocked I didn't know I had no no idea I also I mean no judgment on them either like I wasn't like sitting around going are these people crazy like I was not thinking that I was just confused because I wouldn't have known how else to operate except for to cook the meals, you know? <laughs> so it's like, um, it, it was news to me. But then I said, well, would you want to cook? Would you cook if you knew, you know, if you knew? I was like, do you like these things? Like I was cooking for them. And I was like, well, did you like this dish? And they're like, yeah. I said, well, do you want me to show you how to make it? You know? And so some of them let me. And that was how I started teaching. I mean, that's when I learned 
that they needed me to teach them how to cook, but they didn't want to really ask me to teach them how to cook because that was diminishing, right? Like, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> no, that's great. I mean, it, it, it was funny because I, I had a lot of people there when they come to carnivore diet, even they go, well, I can't cook. I've never cooked meat. I remember being at that stage in my life and I, I was doing all these um, fancy Indian vegetarian meals and stuff like that. And then suddenly I'm frightened of, of, of putting a steak in a pan and flipping it over. You know, it's so simple, isn't it? It's so, yeah. So so what's going on now? What 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 are you, are you actually doing now with this this whole uh, farm to fork thing? Because it's just wonderful. Tell people about what you're doing with it now. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, I went from realizing that people just needed help cooking. And so for years, I was just like, you know, people would call me just to learn how to cook. And that was how I was selling the farm fresh food, because they needed the components to cook, right. And then it turned into, um, you know, people calling me whose children you know, their lives were being threatened with some dis-ease or, you know, usually it was some parents coming to me because of their children. And so all I was doing all the time was trying to help save the babies. And so I created this, it's a counter economic strategy. It is a, an alternative to the centralized food system, but I didn't know all this before. Like I know this today, but like at the time I was like, just trying to, you know, how do I get people the food, you know? Well, I found out um, I'm not allowed to help them get the food. It's illegal, in fact, for me to try to help them get the food. It's more illegal for me to talk to another mother and share, you know, with the mother what I learned as a mother, like two adults just having a conversation. That conversation is de facto illegal. So it's not de jure illegal. It's not actually illegal. But in this litigious society, they could sue me for giving them bad medical advice or whatever. And so then I kept, then I had to figure out, hey, I'm talking to these strangers, you know, who are calling me because they hear about our story and they want to know what we did to help save our daughter. And I want to help them also. Um, how do I do that without worrying about the litigious threat? So I created a 501c3 because I learned that churches could feed people and it didn't matter what the quality was and religious leaders can say anything they want to whomever shows up and there's nothing illegal about that. So I effectively became the high priestess of the pasture and I opened up my food church where we could just talk about food. And so it was pretty crazy because Phil, I lost a lot of people right at the food church name. Cause they were like, what? Because you know, if they were they like a lot of people were like, what church, what religion are you trying to convert me to? Or we're not religious, we're atheist and you know, or something of that nature. And I was like, okay, do you want to learn how to save your child? <laughs> Cause they would call me and ask me, right? And so I'm like, you called me. So the way that this works is you become, you know, part of the congregation and you have to pay a fee because if you are paying your tithes, then you have chosen to join the church. And this is the evidence that you chose to join the church, which is, you know, you exchanging the money. Like when you pay the fee, that is your, it's better than a legal contract because look, what I learned is that if you write things down, whatever it is, it is just creating an opportunity for somebody to take this paper and figure out how to punch holes in it. That's really all it is. But if there's no paper for them to decipher, you know, then they can't do anything. But the legal exchange of tenure, of tender of the money, um, is enough for me to say they were paying me money for me to talk to them and they came willingly i did not impose myself on them as evidenced by the money that they paid me and so 
that's why I have a membership fee and I have, you know, I mean, you can say consulting fee, but I can't call it a consulting fee because that's illegal, but they can pay tithes to the church because they want to support the work of the high priestess of the pasture. So <laughs> that is, that's what we do. You know, you want to play a game. I can play a game too. We can just, you know, figure it all out. So because it's so convoluted, you know, it's very difficult for people to find uh, help for their children. And there's a lot of people who also would say that I am, you know, selling some snake oil. And so it's, you know, a lot of people wouldn't trust it if their child was very seriously ill. But I've worked with thousands of families now, and we have reversed everything from seizures to MS and cancer and Crohn's and everything that you can think of that's head and gut and skin related, you know, um, it's all going away, but you know, you have to, you have to get on the regenerative meat for it to work. It is incredible what happens, isn't it? I mean, the snake oil thing and people say that, um, people say that we're selling snake oil and the reversals that you see that you, you almost have to pinch yourself sometimes, don't you? And people don't believe you because because I've worked for many years for pe with people on all kinds of diets and you see little improvements, but I've never seen any kind of improvement like you get on the carnivore diet, just, just complete remissions of stuff. And, and you, 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 so you just have to, you just have to really accept that people are just not going to, not going to believe you of, 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 of what you're doing because in other diets you'll see, you see like little improvements and this kind of works and that kind of works. And then suddenly, you know, it's like when people just like Anthony Chafee says, you know, 95% of the benefits often come when the last 5% of the veg are dropped. And so you see people coming from keto diets, to carnivore diets, and then people just can't believe there's that small difference, but there is. And it's, it's quite incredible. But if, I mean, if they knew that, if this was common knowledge, that would be the end. That would be the end of the whole of food science. It would be the, the end of the pharmaceutical industry, more than likely. I mean, which is why we're being villainized all the time, right? Like, you know, they want to terrify everybody of the meat. And that's why, you know, there's like this latest um, attack on meat. And, and then they want to make fun of us and say, oh, you know, these people are saying that there's a war on meat. Of course, it's the same, you know, whatever people. And I'm like, okay, you know, you've assaulted nature so many times. Like, you know, you assaulted um, eggs, you assaulted butter, you assaulted red meat, you know, you've assaulted the sun. You know, they, they are assaulting nature it's interesting to me that they never assault you know any of the drugs that like are actually murdering people you know or the physicians who are given full reign over a life and they're able to lose this life and it's like you know medical um, you know, faux pas. Um, I think there's more medical practitioners who are serial killers than there are anything else. I mean, truly, because they have permission, they have free reign. Um, and, and, you know, how many people do we talk to, Phil, that worship these, they will do only what the doctor says, you know, that's a lot of power. That's a, that's a lot of power. It's terrifying. I mean, that's more terrifying to me than the cows out on the pasture, you know? Um, so I know it's, it's amazing when, um, and you get even some of the, the more sort of holistic healers and they, <laughs> as soon as they get some kind of diagnosis themselves, they're straight off to the doctors. How many sort of homeopaths and vegan influences and whatever, as soon as they get a cancer diagnosis, it's chemo and then they're gone and they're terrified and they're serious fear, fear they're straight terrified. away isn't it yeah straight yeah. away I, i'm like how did you go to the doctor to find out about the cancer because <laughs> I'm, I'm like, i i fired all our doctors 
you know, the last time anybody had hold of my children was, was when they were dealing with Mina at that time. I mean, you know, well, I, I can't say that my son broke his wrist and we did go and let them fix his wrist. You know, that was crazy, but he healed so fast and his bones healed so hard that they couldn't pull the pins out of his wrist because the, the bone like cooked all around the pins and they had to practically almost re-break his arm to get the pins out because that's how, how much his uh, bone healed. Um, the doctor couldn't believe it. He said, normally these pins just fall out. And I was like, I mean, they put a cast around it to hold the pins in. I thought, that wow, that's amazing, isn't it? I mean, you see an awful lot of it when people come, particularly from vegan diets, and they've had DEXA scans and they've got no bone density. And all of a sudden on a carnivore diet, you see this bone density coming back and whatever. And it can. That's it. That's the miracle. You know, people don't know that you can remineralize bone and teeth and, and all of these things can repair themselves. And they just, they just don't believe it, you know, and someone said to me, well, I, I just don't know if I can work with you. Like, I don't know if I believe what you, you know, I just don't believe what you believe. And I'm like, that's okay. Like, I don't care. I have a t-shirt that says, I don't care. And on the back of it, it says, there is great love here for you because, you know, I can only share with you the truths of the law. This is, this is universal law, you know, it's. I didn't just make this up. I mean, I'm not a, I'm not the person who came up with this, you know, or, or, or you or whoever, like, you know, we're not, none of us are going around saying, Oh, look at what I did, you know, or claiming that we're the authority or whatever. We're just saying that, Oh, we made this observation, which by the way, is a, is a scientific term <laughs> made this observation. <laughs> But I think it's amazing that in thousands of families that I've worked with, um, whether or not they're 1 million percent cured of whatever it was that was ailing them, none of, the, it was 0% that regressed, 0% that got worse, 0% that didn't have some improvement. And I mean, you know, come on, the, the reason for that is that it is mandatory. Compliance is mandatory. So you have to um, eliminate the plant material and, you know, it's, it's difficult for a lot of them to, to 1 million percent do that all the time or whatever, you know, because it's not even that they're always going back to like the sugar or to the Doritos. It might just be that, you know, they're like us Indian and we were so extra vegetarian and on rice, it's, rice is like hard to let go sometimes or or you know the herbs the seasoning the flavor you know sometimes it's difficult to do that but me and you know that if you can just get down to salt or just go to blood and no salt then you feel better even faster right yeah it's uh it, it, it's it's amazing isn't it sorry i'm a bit distracted by the kids at the moment they're running in and out and making a terrible racket oh. i've got it on silent all the time um yeah, I mean, something that you said but a little while ago, it was it was it was really, really important. And I think that just this is just natural law and this is what we're missing. I mean, what how do you think and how have you seen the sort of spirituality and religion as well down the ages has 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 co-opted all of this and tried to get us onto, you know, away from our essential nature? You know, the essential uh, message of spirituality is very simple and it is true. But then you get gurus jumping on it, using that as a carrot and a stick. And then, then of course, literally, you've got to eat carrots. You know, you've got to be vegetarian. You've got to do all this crap or you're never going to get enlightened. And, and you know, how, how is this? How have you seen this play out now? Because this is, this is a, another huge influence on the, the whole taking us away from our, our ancestral heritage. Agreed. Oh, my gosh. Well, you know, I'm Indian. And if you're Indian and you're female, you know, you can't be enlightened if you don't fast, basically. And if you do eat, it can only be plants because, you know, the animals will drive you to rage. You know, the, the false belief is that people who eat meat are aggressive. 
And, you know, I'm kind of aggressive. <laughs> I'm kind of, you know, like, I don't, I don't take anything, you know, I'm not, I'm not, um, I'm definitely um, not cowering, I guess, to other people's ideals. And so therefore, you know, I guess I'm a threat or something, but, you know, I find that when I removed all the plants, I've never felt so calm. When I removed all the plants, I was able to really love unconditionally. I would never have been able to do that before. I was able to offer grace and forgiveness. And I definitely could not do that on waffles. I mean, I couldn't do it. Like when I was on waffles and brown sugar and butter, because I was very pregnant and I remember someone introduced me to brown sugar on waffles and I thought that was the way. And I ate a lot of them. I mean, outside of the inflammation and the heartburn and oh my God, you know, I know how to cook. Okay. I know how to make all the Indian subsies and the dals and the everything. I know I'm a very proficient Indian cook. Okay. And I can also cook Creole and Southern and Italian and all these different things. And I love, I love to cook. I, I still love to, to make all those things. I love to smell what it smells like, you know, that nostalgia. Of, I mean, I love to cook for other people and I'll just send it off because it just makes me happy to smell it, but I can't dare eat that stuff because it, you know, like kills me. I was, you know, I was, I'm actually working on a, on my new book, which is about my, my healing, my health. And, um, it speaks about, about these things that, you know, it was very, one of the things for me for carnivore that was really, really hard that I didn't realize was that it was very difficult for me to reconcile allowing myself to eat enough meat to be satisfied because I'm not allowed to eat more meat than my husband. That's crazy, you know? And how do, how do I, like, he wasn't telling me I couldn't eat it. And I'm the, the, the one who is the, you know, person who is aggregating all the food for the home. So he's not involved in that at all, especially because we quit shopping at grocery stores 12 years ago, right? So even before carnivore and whatever, right? I was getting things from the farms, like I just told you. <laughs> so, you know, I was even buying the wheat locally from somebody who has it here, you know, like we have a mill here in North Carolina that I was getting it from. And so, um, you know, forget about carnivore. I was, I was cooking and everything from scratch, but when I would try to make my plate, you know, it was, I didn't realize that I was self-sabotaging myself and not allowing myself to eat it because it just didn't look right, you know? And so I would just allow myself to be hungry. And so if you try to go low, you know, this is what I'm going to reveal in the book because I'm not even done with my healing. And mostly it's because I had to realize for myself, you know, you don't see a whole bunch of pictures about me before and after because I'm not done. I'm still reversing, like I reversed three autoimmune conditions. All I can say right now is that I'm not in pain. Praise the Lord that I'm not in pain. And I started losing weight finally, but you know, also I was, you know, I had three autoimmune conditions and I was starving myself too much and I wasn't allowing myself to be nourished properly. I mean, there's a lot of nuances to this carnivore thing. And, uh, and the other part of it was that I, um, uh, emotionally, um, was sabotaging. Is it emotional? No, it's like, um, psychologically, you know, sabotaging myself. Um, because I just didn't think that it was okay for me to, I mean, I don't know. I just thought it was fine. Like I could just, I don't eat that much, you know, and I would just not eat because it's also easy to fast. You know, and I could just give more food to the children or something like, I felt very weird eating more meat than my teenage son or my daughter or my husband. That's a very Indian thing, by the way, like, you know, you feed everybody. So you're, you know, as the mom, you feed everyone and you're not allowed to 
you don't eat before everybody either. And you can't like, I can't change my whole schedule and my whole routine, which you know, you have to do to really be able to heal properly. (laughs) So I was just really sabotaging myself. And it's only after I decided that I had to like really completely shed my slave self and allow myself to walk more powerfully into this masterful life and, and feed myself. My husband was just like, why are you doing this? I didn't tell you to do that. Cause I would have these conversations with him. I would say, oh my gosh, I, th- I think I need to do this. And oh, this isn't working. So I should do, he goes, well, why don't you just do it? And I said, well, you should eat more too. So I can eat more, you know? And he's like, that's dumb. He's like, just, to, just to eat what you need. And, you know, just, if, you know, but it was, I, I think that, you know, like I am a very spiritual person. I do find that, you know, I mean, who doesn't want to be enlightened? <laughs> I mean, you know, we're all liquid love guys. You know, we just want to be better lovers of everyone and we want to serve people well, right? Like that is what we all want. Who, who doesn't want to do that? I mean, maybe there's those lunatics out there. I mean, obviously someone's crazy that's out there, but most of them are on plants. And I will say that until I removed all of that, I wasn't able to give myself full permission. I wasn't able, I don't think I was able to love myself actually. And and I think that we know anyone who's experienced this, that you can't give anything if you don't have it for yourself. If you don't have it, if you're, if you can't fill your cup up, how can you pour it over anybody else? That's perfect. That's really powerful. And, and I I see it so much when you've only got to see a conversation on a, on, on one of these um, Facebook threads or something between vegans and carnivores and the carnivore is always chilled. And they're they're, they're there screaming away and saying what murderers we are and how aggressive we are. And we're just there sort of just chatting and saying, hey, you know, it's it's okay, whatever. Uh, It's 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 quite it's quite astonishing. But it's when somebody's in that position, Mm -hmm. it's the last thing, the last thing that you would ever think that would bring you peace and would bring you stability and that calmness. Yeah. And it's just so many layers of it is taking taking us away from that yeah on I, yeah on yeah purpose. absolutely so, so, so um you were talking with dr anthony chafee and he said something to you you were talking about how you were following the indian foods and stuff right and he said something about the spirituality and how even in india that they were meat eaters right And, um, and I was thinking about it and I was like, ah, here's all this logic again, right? This logic just comes pouring in the observations, me observing things, you know, um, scientifically, you know, uh, that, oh, they went after Africa, China, India, right? Like the largest populations on the planet. And they wanted to obviously, you know, enslave their minds first, you know, because this is the majority of the people. And so, you know, it's only logical that they would want to weaken the largest populations immediately, right? I mean, that that makes sense. If you're trying to take over the world or whatever, I mean, listen, guys, you know, I know people don't like this talk because no one wants to believe that they've been brainwashed or, you know, taken for, you know, taken for a ride or anything like that. But I think that it is easy to see that, you know, you, what you need is love and cooperation to be successful. And what, what has been established by the institutions is chaos and confusion and division. And so, you know, I had to make a decision, Bill, that I was no longer going to allow chaos and confusion and that I was going to demand and only operate with deliberate intention and, you know, my knowing, which is why I was looking for the solid ground, you know? And I think that meat really is what helped me find that. It's, it's so amazing how satiety, satisfaction allows you to chill. And you can only do that with fat. 
from animals. I can't do it on avocados. Can you? No, I never liked them anyway. And there's only like one minute when they're ripe when, before they start rotting. They're either rock hard or they're black and you've got like three minutes to eat them. You know, I, I kind of used to force myself to eat them and I found them quite nice chopped up in scrambled eggs and with some bacon. But, you know, it, I felt a lot better when I got rid of that stuff. So, yeah, much better. And it was the bacon grease that was letting you even tolerate it. Yeah, yeah, it was. It was absolutely. And I, I you said something interesting about India, you know, and I remember reading some article somewhere about going through the times when India has stopped eating meat has coincided with the times when they've been conquered. Something like that. 400 years. <laughs> 400 years they were under British rule. And you know, the year that my mother was born in 47, that was the year of the, you know, um, that was that was when they were released from British rule. And this is something that's interesting. Our parents will never say that they were slaves. Like, you know, in the States here, there's this huge thing all the time about, but we were enslaved and this whole big thing. And I'm like, you guys weren't slaves like as recently as we were, okay? You weren't. And none of us are talking about it because we've realized, maybe it's the enlightenment, I don't really know. But like, we've realized that if you're just gonna talk about your enslavement, you're gonna have to own that slavery and you're gonna have to walk in it. And, and we're not gonna do that. So, you know, you can keep talking about it. I think that somebody keeps bringing it up in our media. I don't know who that could be, but somebody keeps bringing it up <laughs> so that there is a constant reminder to a specific group of people that they're lesser than everybody else. But they could just decide to not participate in that you know, and they could just, you know, stand in their knowing that they are born worthy, you know, beyond belief. Um, but I mean, I had to do that too, right? So that was part of my healing was, wait a minute, I can eat three pounds of meat right now. If that's what I want, if I need three pounds of meat, I just need to eat it. And I need to just let myself do that. And why am I not letting myself do that? You know, because I'm hungry. Like, I just need to eat it. And so I started to hear um, another friend of ours, you know, Emily Penton. She just, she always used to say, you need to put the meat in the mouth. You need to put the meat in the mouth. And I used to think it was so funny. And I would just hear her in the background going, put the meat in the mouth. And so then I just, you know, I was like, yes, I'm hungry. I just need to put the meat in the mouth. And it changed my life. It just changed everything. And I mean, you know, people can't always physically see the healing that we're experiencing, you know, whatever people think that's supposed to look like or whatever. I mean, like I said, I haven't done any like before and afters. I'm still healing. I just came to some of these revelations for myself because there was a lot of improvement in how I felt. Could have been more. Could have been better, could have been faster if I, but you know, like I'm over 50, menopause, blah, blah, blue, blue, ding, 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 you know, all these things, you know, and people say, well, it takes longer for, for carnivore to help older people. That's lies. What it is, is it takes a little bit longer for us to change our minds and allow uh, ourselves to do the things that we need to do or allow our ourselves to to listen to our body and allow ourselves to sa satisfy ourselves like actually in the ways that we require because that's the other thing that spirituality does is it makes you feel like you're just um gluttonous you know you're just demanding all this meat because you're crazy and you know Maybe you feel that way for a minute and maybe subconsciously I was feeling, I mean, I don't really know. I know that I was messed up in the head and I was definitely um, not allowing myself to be satisfied properly. And I mean, it just takes time. I think it's kind of a quantum leap, isn't it, Phil? Like for you to go from all the way believing that meat will turn you into some vicious beast and to not not allowing that to affect you. 
Well, there's so, there's so many powerful influences. I mean, one is that is that like you, you mentioned, the guilt and shame. They're very, very powerful emotions and they play on that, don't they? I mean, when they're trying to get you to do anything, they play on that. They played on it with the jabs. You know, if you don't get your jab, granny's jab won't work. You know, I mean, when has that ever existed in history, even in even in their theories? And yet they play it out now. Yeah, it's crazy. But listen, yeah, my Lucy. mask protects you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I tell you, I posted something on my Facebook today, which is 15 minutes of a PPE expert. That is the end of the whole muzzle theory. It's the end of it. It's 15 minutes of it. It's on um, Ivor Cummins. Yeah, the Irish dude. Oh, yeah. It's on his. So look, look up if anyone hasn't seen it, the one about the PPE expert. There's 15 minutes that needs to be played to anybody who still wears one of those ridiculous contraptions on their face. And that will be the end of it because there is, oh, anyway, yeah, so many things we could go into about that one. We've been naughty enough. Now, I know you've got a, another appointment coming up real soon and to give you a break in between them. But Neethi, that was amazing. We could go on for way longer. And I'm sure we're, you know, in the future we'll chat loads. And I can't wait to meet you in person. Oh, me too. If they'll ever let us just meet each other. Like, I want to come there so bad. And, you know, I'm having my first food church conference here this October. I really would have loved to have all the Red Pill authors here. But Well, you never know. And, 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 and bring a band over. I mean, I, I want to see a time when we're playing one of your events over there. Me on drums. John Gusty on bass. And then we'll bring some other people up. So that would be fantastic. Yeah. Oh my gosh, that would be so. Fun. Maybe even even Brett get Brett Lloyd along on guitar. Yeah, I think a full band. Like, yeah. yeah, Brett Brett plays great. Yeah, yeah. Oh. But my. anyway, Neithy, okay. just before before you charge off, just let everybody know where they can find you. I'll put it in the show notes anyway. Yeah. But uh, let everybody know where where they can find you and what you're up to. Sure. I'm actually in the middle of building a new platform. So very soon um, I'll have meetthebali.com up. It's being built right now. But um, in the meantime, uh, if you go to farm to fork meat riot.org, F A R M T O F O R K M E A T R I O T dot O R G, that works. Oh, I can't hear you. There Sorry. You go failed to hit the mute button um <laughs> thank you and marvelous work you're doing and i shall see you soon Nithi. thank you so much, for you so much. Thank, you. thank you hey friends i hope you enjoyed this episode and if you like it please share it with all your friends and if you are interested in knowing my story or learning about the nonprofit work that I do, then please read my book. I'll make sure that there's a link in the notes. And while you're at our website, then you know you could become a sustainer and help support regenerative agriculture. We really appreciate you guys. Thank you so much. And we'll see you next time.